You can actually be seated for just a moment, if you will. For the last three weeks, we've been talking about stewardship. And so um, you've received an envelope today. Did everybody receive an envelope as they came in? And you haven't looked at it yet, have you? If you'll just hold on, don't look at it yet. And uh, there will be a place in the service where I'll ask you to take it out. But stewardship, folks, so often people think about stewardship as only bringing our tithes and offerings into the building. Uh, actually, I've saved this sermon to the last because this is where it belongs. Uh, just coming and giving uh, in that way is not, that's, I don't think that's what God desires out of our life. Uh, stewardship is more than that. So what is stewardship? Stewardship is prayer. It's the interior journey of, uh, of the transformation within each of us. Um, stewardship is service. We, we talked about Mother Teresa when we talked about service. But the fact is, is that I see service in this church uh, and the ways in, in which people reach out and the ways in which that they um, work in this community and, and in other places. Stewardship is worship. It's important for us to come here to be a part of this each Sunday, uh, to be involved uh, in this way. And with that transformation of life that comes with all that, uh, stewardship is gifts. It is the gifts that we bring um, into the presence of God. It's, it's, just, it's, uh, it's the culmination of all those things of how we respond. Abe Lincoln, um, years ago I read a story about he and his boys, and it says that uh, Abe Lincoln and two of his boys were walking down the street, and the two boys were just, were just crying and pitching a fit. And so Abe Lincoln, the friend says to Abe Lincoln, what's wrong with your boys? And Abe Lincoln says, I've got three walnuts, and each one of them wants two. Do you get that? I've only got three walnuts, but each one of them wants two. And so they're fighting over who's going to get that third one. Folks, being a Christian today is, is it's a disciplined life, and it's, and it's a struggle against the culture we live in. If you talk to most young people, not every young person, but if you talk to most young people, you will say to them, what is it that you desire most in life? And most of them might say to you something along these lines. I want to get my education. I want to get a good job. And I want to have lots of money with lots of things uh, to go with that. And you know what? Culture, it continues giving us that message over and over and over till finally we buy into it ourselves. Um, how large is large enough? How much is enough? How much, how much is it that it really takes for us to live? Now that's a question that we have to ask ourselves because that's a question that we struggle with every day. But parents, let me tell you something. I think it's important that we, when we talk about discipline, that it's important that you teach your children about financial discipline, about uh, just as you teach them discipline in other areas of their life, I think teaching them how to budget, how to be disciplined in order to operate on that which they will, that they will be able to earn. Whether it be $10,000 a year, or whether it be $100,000 a year, or more. I mean, somewhere along the line, our government could learn from that, actually, if we could learn to operate within our means. But we're always borrowing. It's okay to borrow. It's okay. It's okay. And then we get ourselves into such a place that, that we become slaves. We become slaves to the debt. The debt, not only the, the financial debt, but the debt of doing it the same way all the time. Now, uh, this morning, you may wonder what these apples are doing up here. And I'm going to use those in a few minutes about uh, in the sermon itself. But I've heard uh, somebody say one time about a young pastor that was called on, on the just spur of the moment to offer the prayer whenever the offering was brought forward. And so as they elevated the offering, here's the, here's the prayer. Lord, in all we say and do, here's what we really think of you. Amen. The senior pastor was livid. How in the world could he say such a thing? But if you think about it, Really and truly, there's some truth in that. In that, you know what, I have no problem giving God my heart. I have no problem being in service to God. But then when it comes to sharing my money, that's different. 
Well, I'm saying to you this morning that stewardship is, is really, there's no difference. Stewardship is a way of life. It's about how we think about all aspects of our life. The Bible, in the Bible, there are about 500 verses that talk about prayer. There's about 500 verses that talk about faith. But there's over 2,000 verses that talk about our possessions and about our money, about how, what possesses us. 16 of the 35 parables that Jesus talks about in the Bible has to do with money and possessions, almost half. Now, I find that utterly amazing that, that with that much emphasis on that, that so often we feel a little uncomfortable when we begin talking about this. But I don't think, I don't think we should be uncomfortable. I think it should be, um, it, it's just a part of our life. It's a part of who we are of being disciplined as Christians and about living out that part of our life, of including that, that it becomes a part of it. Now, from the book of Malachi, hear these words. From the third chapter of Malachi, verse 10, the scriptures say this to us. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and thus put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you an overflowing blessing. And then from the Gospel of Luke, from the 6th chapter, starting with verse 36, hear these words. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, you will not be judged. Do not condemn, you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure that you get back thanks be to god for his word that word there of give and it will be given back to you has been used by some who preach prosperity gospel folks i'm not a big fan of prosperity gospel that is give uh, you know and god will always give back to you uh if you give god ten dollars god will give you back a hundred dollars a thousand dollars that's not what the bible says about giving what the Bible says about giving is that as we open ourselves up, do you notice the lead into that giving part there in the Gospel of Luke? It was about giving forgiveness. It was about living out a life, a way of life in which that our hearts have been altered. They've been transformed that God can use all of us, not just our money, but God uses all of us in that discipline. Well, I don't know about you, but... but Giving takes, to me, takes three forms. There's grudge giving, and then there's duty giving, and then there's thanksgiving. Grudge giving is what your children do when you, when you, uh, you know, you feed them uh, three meals a day. You give them a good place to sleep. Uh, you carry them back and forth to wherever where they want to go. And then you say to them, would you clean your room? Oh, no. I will if I have to. There's not very much good response in that, is there? I will if I have to. And so, so often in the church, we think about that, God, I've worked hard for what I've got, and do I have to give it to the church? The answer is no, you don't. No, you don't have to. Does that surprise you? No, you don't have to. But we give why? Why do we give? I think that would be an honest question to ask ourselves this morning. Why do you give? Why do I give? Why do we serve? Why do we do whatever we do in the church? Why do we do that? It's a good question. And then there's a sort of a duty giving that we give simply because, um, you know, they expect me to give, so I guess I'll, I guess I'll do it. I guess if I have to, I will do it. And then there's that sense of, well, you know, God's been good to me, and I guess I need to do that. That's not much of a response either, but rather an act of thanksgiving for what God has done in your life. Now, when I talk about this, I'm not talking to you. I told the first service this morning, I had a fellow in the church one time that he loved to preach on Sunday mornings, especially if, if I were going to be out of town. So I was going to be out of town, and I gave Jake the opportunity. And, and he said to me, he said, Preacher, while you're gone, I'm going to preach on giving. 
And I said, that's okay, Jake, that's good. And so when I got back, there were some folks that were upset. <laughs> and, and I said, Jake, what happened? And he said, well, I was going along and I was doing really good. I was telling the folks why they needed to give and why they needed to, you know, respond to God. And I was telling them that, you know, it's our nature. It's a good thing that we're giving back and that God is blessing that. And then he said, I got to the part of the sermon. I said, you need to give, but I don't. Because I make too much money and it hurts when I give 10% of what I have. I said, Jake, what was the response to that? And he said, well, at that point, I think they just closed me down. And I said, they should have. They should have. Can you imagine trying to tell somebody else, this is how you need to live when you're not willing to even do it yourself? I have to tell you, folks, that I haven't tithed my entire Christian life. But for most of my married life, I have. We take our tithe and write it out at the first. It's not waiting until, not waiting until I see what I've got left over. That's really kind of what these apples represent up here, the, the tithe. There's ten apples here, and, and I was looking this morning, and I thought, well, my goodness, look at that. Food line sent... They sold me an apple that's got a bad place in it. And so uh, if that represented my life, that's the one I'll give to God because it's not perfect. So I'll give to God. I want to keep the other nine perfect. And so I want to give to God the one unperfect. But you know what the Bible says? The Bible says to bring the best gifts, the first fruits, those that God has given to us, bring those into the storehouse. But let's say that, you know what, this is the one I've decided to give God. It's a little bit tarnished, but you know what, I'm, I'm, this is my tithe. It, there's, I still have nine, and that's enough. And so I'm going to take, I'm gonna take uh, this, this apple. Is, you know, wow, that looks good, doesn't it? It does look good. I'm kind of hungry. But you know what? I saw a sweater I really want. So I, I'm, I'm going to take just part of that that belongs to God and Oh, that's good. You ought to taste that, guys. That's really good. I hope I don't choke. I hope I don't choke on that. <laughs> but look how much I've got left that I'm going to give to God. That is incredible, isn't it? But you know what? I saw a cover for my iPhone I'd love to have. So God won't miss if I take just another piece. I'm not going to try to bite that one. I almost choked on that last piece. But I'm still, that's almost half, and that ought to be good enough. But there's some unexpected things happen. I need to take a little bit more. There's something else I need, so. You know what? That's what I'll give to God. That's pretty stark, isn't it, when we look at that, when we think about that. That's not what tithing is, folks. Tithing represents to us that we brought the first fruits of that which God has blessed us with. According to the Department of Labor, our income is disposed of in many ways. We spend about 34% of their income on housing, 18% on transportation, 12% on food, 11% on insurance, pensions and social securities and then 13 percent we spend on personal care and then everything else i don't know about most of us but marketing in this country has got such a hold on us that we've got to run out i'm amazed at the number of people that stood in line to get the first iphone 5 that had the iphone 4 for 18 months and now they want an iphone 5 why is that? I mean, what, what in the world could make us want to do things like that? Of, of just, it's not good enough. It's never good enough. And that's really how our lives start working out. It's never good enough. But when we bring the first tithe into God and lay it at God's altar, and that's our response for what God has blessed us with. For, uh, Second Chronicles 31 tells us to do this. As soon as the order went out, the Israelites generously gave the first fruits of their grain, new wine, and oil and honey, 
and all the fields produced, they brought a great amount, a tithe of everything. I have to tell you that if, if, if you think about tithing, as, as that's a good way for us to fund the budget here at the church. That's not a good, that's not, I would, I would just assume, and I hope the stewardship folks close their ears. If that's how you think about it, just keep the money in your pocket because that's not what it's for. When I think about giving to the church, I think about the, it's underwriting the ministries and things we try to do here. We try to tithe back 10% of, of our total budget back to mission in some way. Most of the time we're successful in doing that. Sometimes it's difficult, but most of the time we try to do that so that we are, we're trying to do things outside this body of, of simply doing the work of God somewhere other than just within these walls. But I know some of you may not tithe and, and you'll say, gosh, well, I'll just start with 10% today. Well, if you can do that, that's wonderful. Most of us can't. And so what I would say to you is, is that you need to start giving proportionally, 3%. And then make a covenant with God, make, a, make an agreement that you're going to increase that 1% or 2% a year until you can get to the full 10%. Folks, it's not a matter that um, God can't do without your money. Because God can. It was His before you had it, and it'll be His after you're gone. It's about disciplining your life in so that the things that we do and the ways that we respond to God is not just the way the world re would respond. I gave you those envelopes this morning, and I would ask you to open those right now. There's a commitment card in that. I want you to write your name on that envelope, if you will. Make sure you write that on the outside. This, is, uh, this commitment card is operational. This is our, what we call our budget. This is our operational budget. You will notice that there's not a figure on there for our budget because we, it's fluid. We are always working with that. But the fact is, is I want you to look over the questions there. That, that card asks you, will you pray for your church? It asks you, will you serve? Will you be in mission? It asks you, will you give? And if there's any one part of those that you don't agree with, then write no there and sign the card. I mean, be honest. If you choose not to do that, be honest because nobody's going to call you and beat on you if you don't do that. The Apostle Paul writes this. He says, each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly, not under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. <laughs> okay, are you done? I want you to take it and put it back in the envelope and seal that envelope up, okay? Let's pray. Almighty and gracious God, in our hearts and our minds, we've already we've decided what it is that we want to do as far as our giving. We've already made up our mind. And I pray, O oh God, that as we have made up our mind, that each of us in our heart will covenant that that is what we want to do. That we want to, this to, be a, to represent the way, O oh God, in which that we trust you and we love you. And we pray, O oh Lord, that as we do these things, that you will honor that which was placed on each one of these cards this morning, these covenant cards, these commitment cards, and that you will bless it, O oh God, that you will allow us to live out that which we have committed to you and that which we have promised. And now, O oh Lord, I pray that you would use it for your honor and your glory in the name of Christ. Amen. Now, here's what I want you to do with that envelope. I want you to fold it up and put it in your pocket, put it in your Bible, do whatever you want to do with it. Because